Hello, everybody. In today's lecture, we're going to talk about uh, an intersection of ideas between topology and the analysis of time series data. Uh, so let's get started. Time series are ubiquitous in data science. Many, many interesting data sets come in the form of time varying observations. For instance, um, here is a plot of a data set describing uh, the U.S. median house price, um, uh, the z-score at least, um, as a function of time. Um, so this is a time series data, and one aspect of, of, of the particular data set we're looking at here is that it has a recurring pattern. So uh, this idea of recurring patterns or repetitions um, is going to be a topic that is going to appear several times uh, throughout today's lecture. Another instance of uh, processes that change with time are of biological nature. Uh, think, for example, of the circadian clock or the cell division. Uh, so all of these are uh, processes that happen in biological systems and which are governed by a clock. Um, in the bottom left, I included a figure from this 2008 Nature paper um, where they describe how uh, the genes of uh, yeast uh, change with time as the cell goes through uh, cellular division. Um, but these, uh, the idea of recurrence and repetition is not only constrained to real value data. So here uh, we have sort of this collage of data modalities from sort of sound recordings um, to sort of fluids evolving in time, um, to videos of vocal folds and also to dynamic networks. So all of these are types of time varying data. And again, the question that uh, I would like to start the lecture with is how to understand recurrence in these time varying systems. Um, one reason to care about recurrence is that if you're thinking about prediction, for example, if an event happened in the past, then you have a better chance to predict it in the future. So recurrence, again, is something that can be used and leveraged for um, prediction purposes. So that's the central question. Uh, what is recurrence and how do we quantify it? And we'll see how topology can help in, in these types of questions. So what is the idea? Um, the, the method uh, that, that we're gonna uh, use throughout uh, the day is called sliding windows. So what is the setup? Imagine that you have a time series. So this is gonna be the curve in red that we're showing here. Um, also, we're gonna fix uh, a number W, which is gonna be a positive real number. And then for every value of T, and T is time, so for each T, we're gonna concentrate in the graph of the function of the time series between t and t plus w, right? So uh, this gives us sort of one little snippet from the function, one window, and notice that as t varies, it's as if we were sliding the window. Uh, so if we take each one of these sort of windows that, that we get in this fashion and we arrange them sort of uh, by their similarity, meaning that sort of snippets or windows that are more similar are going to be closer together, <clears throat> then uh, sort of recurrence at the level of time series or repetition at the level of time series is going to be reflected in the circularity of the arrangement of the windows. So we're going to leverage this idea um, starting right now. So the method that arises from thinking of these sliding windows and trying to look at the shape of the arrangement um, is going, going to be called swipers. So it stands for sliding windows in one persistent scoring. In other words, we're going to use persistent homology to encode the shape of this collection of sliding windows. So here's what we do it. So imagine that you have a time series, um, which can be assumed to be sampled from some function f. So f is going to be some underlying function, um, and then the time series is uh, produced by evaluating f at a particular collection of time points. Okay, we're going to select 
two parameters uh, to construct our sliding windows. Uh, the first parameter is going to be the delay. So this is tau. Tau is going to be a positive real number. And then D, which is going to give us the dimension of the sliding window embedding. So what do we do? For every T in the domain, we can do the following. We can evaluate the underlying function f at the points t, t plus tau, t plus two tau, and all the way up to t plus d tau, right? So essentially what this is doing is it's discretizing uh, the window between t and t plus d tau. Or said another way, we're discretizing the window of uh, length uh, d times tau, and we're doing it uh, using uh, steps of length tau. So if we now put all these values in a vector, uh, say like this, then we obtain what is called um, the sliding window of f at t with parameters d and tau. So again, we're putting the, the, the function f, we're gonna evaluate it at t, at t plus tau, t plus two tau, and all the way up to t plus d tau. Uh, this is gonna give you a vector of length d plus one, right? So each window is gonna give you a point in Euclidean space. And now the, the, the thing to keep in mind is that as the window slides, meaning as we change our T, we are actually gonna get a point cloud in RD plus one, right? So each point here in this point cloud is actually a window uh, from the original time series. Um, the collection of all these points, we're gonna call it the sliding window point cloud, and we're gonna denote it with this sort of fancy SW, meaning that we're evaluating the sliding window in some collection of points in some interval I, or some subset of points I. Um, and this is the object that we're gonna study now using ideas from topological data analysis, in particular persistent homology. So to summarize, um, we start with our uh, time series. Uh, we do the sliding window construction, so we get a sliding window point cloud where, again, each point here uh, corresponds to a window that has been discretized from the original time series. Um, when I, I, I'm going to put an asterisk here to denote the fact that uh, one can do other processes or other transformations to the sliding window point cloud. For example, uh, one can do dimensionality reduction or one can do denoising if, if, if you want to uh, improve the shape of the, of the sliding window point cloud. <clears throat> Once you have the, the sliding window point cloud, then we compute the persistent homology of the collection of RIPS complexes as we've done before. So we do RIPS persistent homology. Uh, and in particular, we can compute, let's say, the one-dimensional persistent homology. So we're computing homology dimension one. Um, so in this case, if the, again, if the uh, time series was recurrent or periodic, then one should expect the sliding window point cloud to accumulate in a cycle. And again, the idea is that as the sliding window, as the window slide, let's say to the right, then a window that is appeared here perhaps starts here. And as you move to the right, then the windows move, let's say around the circle. And then when you get here to the end, you look at a window that is very similar to the one that you started with. Right. So in that sense, recurrence of the time series is reflected in circularity of the sliding window point cloud, and that is going to be captured by a very persistent feature in the one dimensional persistence diagram of the sliding window point cloud. Um, one thing that one can compute is this number MP. So MP is going to be the maximum persistence um, of all the points in the persistence diagram. So remember that the persistence of a point in here is gonna be the, its vertical distance to the diagonal, and we take the largest, the largest distance, right? So the bigger this number is, then the, 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 most, the more circular the point cloud was, and the more periodic we think the time series was to start with. Um, so here in this plot, I'm showing you uh, what happens when you take uh, four time series. So here in blue, green, red, and, and, and turquoise. So um, the first time series is just sort of uh, a sinusoidal series. Um, and then we add increasing levels of noise to that time series. And we can see how the periodicity starts to degrade as we go down, starting with a function that is sort of very periodic, very recurrent, to a function that is sort of not recurrent at all. 
Then for each function, we compute maximum persistence of the persistence diagram associated to the sliding window point cloud. And we do it for several choices of the window size. Um, you know, remember that uh, the size of the window here is governed by the parameters D and tau. In particular, the length of the window is equal to D times tau. So, so here in this plot, what we're doing is we're keeping the dimension of the sliding window point cloud constant, meaning the, 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 the Euclidean space dimension where we're embedding, and we're changing the tau. So what we can see is that as, as we change the, the size of the window, the maximum persistence, meaning the, the, the score of, of recurrence or periodicity for the time series, is saying that the, the, the time series in blue, meaning the, 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 sinusoid, the sinusoidal, is the most sort of recurrent or periodic of the other two, okay? Um, so we're gonna use these ideas in, in, in a first application. And the, and the application is to the, the, the sort of study of biological clocks or clocks in biological systems. Um, so uh, for more information, you can uh, look at the paper, uh, Swipers, Sliding Windows and One Persistent Scoring, Discovering Periodicity in Gene Expression Time Series Data. So what is the, the type of analysis that this uh, paper uh, presents? So, you know, start with a data set of um, gene expression time series. So for example, here, um, this data is for uh, mice. Uh, so, so this is gene expression, gene expression from mice. Um, and what the experiment uh, consists of is, you know, starting with a collection of, with, with, with sort of a, a set of, of mice, um, sort of the, whose circadian clock has been synchronized, meaning that the mice have been exposed to periods of light and darkness at the same time to synchronize their circadian clocks. Um, then sort of at, a, at several time points, a mouse is selected and a uh, sample of tissue uh, of, of, of liver is uh, uh, extracted and then a gene expression panel is uh, derived from the uh, liver uh, sample. And what you're seeing here is the result of that process. So uh, each row in this Excel file is going to be a probe, meaning um, we're going to measure the gene expression for a particular gene. Uh, so, so, so rows can be thought of as genes. And then columns are going to be the gene expression level at the particular time where the tissue was extracted. Um, so again, rows are genes and columns are time points. So this data set contains roughly um, 45,000 uh, probes. And a typical question in biology is, um, you know, to order, to rank order these um, genes from the most periodic at the top to the less periodic at the bottom. And, and, the, and the idea would be to identify uh, genes that are responsible for controlling the biological clocks that one is studying with the data. So here are the results of, of, using, swi of using swipers, sort of the idea of using sliding windows and persistence to measure the recurrence in these data set of genes. So hopefully what we can see is that at the top of the ranking, we have uh, genes whose time series of expression uh, really does look recurrent and, and, and repetitive. Um, and then towards the bottom of the, of the ranking, uh, sort of around the 44,000 uh, mark, you see these genes uh, that really do not have sort of any, any repetition that is discernible. Um, what you can also see is that uh, other methods, so this column here, column E, is the um, sliding window column, <clears throat> but G, I, and K are columns for other methods, standard methods that uh, sort of scientists in computational biology use to measure periodicity in time series data. So for example, DL uh, stands for the Lichtenberg, LS stands for lums um, and JTK is another sort of method for measuring periodicity. So what you can see is that, for example, lums thinks that this gene right here has sort of 
a non-trivial level of periodicity given its ranking. So it's ranked 6,000 out of 45,000, so more or less. So <clears throat> when you look at the top 10, uh, top 10 percent genes out of 9,000, so this is for a different data. So this is for the yeast metabolic cycle data. And you look at genes that are deemed very, very periodic by swipers. So this is the sliding window column. So these are genes that are in the top percent of swipers that are not in the 10% of any other of these sort of standard methods, right? So these are genes that you would miss if you used either the Lichtenberg, Long Scargo, or, 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 or JPK. And one can see sort of the, the, the rankings that are given. Um, but when you, look, when you look at them, uh, these are genes that are sort of clearly uh, repetitive and periodic. Um, so in other words, sliding windows or swipers is finding novel genes that have periodic characteristics that standard methods uh, missed. Um, also, when you look at consensus analysis, meaning uh, each method, you know, each one of these methods under study for different data sets. So this is the, for the yeast cell cycle data, for the yeast metabolic cycle data, for the mammalian circadian data, when you look at um, what percentage of genes that are considered sort of consensus periodic, so things that many methods uh, identify as being periodic, and you want to know what percentage of those is highly ranked by uh, each one of these methods, so we see that sort of sliding windows uh, sort of has a, a large chunk of, of, of those consensus genes. So in the yeast cell cycle, uh, swipers finds 90%, so more than any other method. In the yeast metabolic cycle data, it finds sort of 93%, sort of the second after lumps cargo. And then in the Mellon-Circadian club, it's a little bit uh, lower, so that 82% is the worst performing here. But in the other um, sort of data sets, and, and, and here too, it sort of finds a large portion of consensus genes, even when it's also able to find novel genes that have not been identified as periodic. So in summary, um, swipers uh, can be used to find and, and, and quantify repetition in, 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 in numerical time series data. Uh, swipers stands for sliding windows and one dimensional persistent scoring and, and, and sort of two characteristics of the methods that have been observed is that it's sort of shape agnostic in the sense that um, it'll score as periodic shapes that look sort of more complicated that's something like a sign like a sinusoidal wave and, and it's also resistant to the effects of damping so if you have a time series that goes like this and then goes not as high but still has repetition in it then swipers will score it uh, sort of uh, highly there's a, another interpretation of, of this idea of sliding windows that comes from the field of dynamical systems that I think is useful. Um, so for, for dynamical systems, um, the, the first uh, sort of object is going to be a space M. So M is going to be the space of states or the state space. Uh, so you can think of M as, you know, perhaps as, as a sphere or maybe M is a torus or a Klein bottle or maybe Euclidean space, okay? So M is a set of states. Uh, and phi is a function from M to itself. So what phi is telling you is how the states in M are evolving with time. Um, so one way to see it is as follows. So imagine that you start at an initial point X zero in your state space M. Then what phi is doing is telling you how the initial point or the initial state is evolving with time. So from x0 to x1, you apply phi one time, you get x1, you apply phi again, you get x2, and then phi again, you get x3, and so on. So you could imagine that a process that is sort of periodic or repetitive would sort of, uh, you know, end up in loops inside the state space, okay? So in addition to having the state space and, and the evolution of the dynamics given by the uh, map phi, we're also going to have an observation function. Um, what the observation function is going to do is for every point in the state space, it's going to report a real number. So something very, very simple. Let me give you an example. So let's imagine that our, that our state space um, is measuring the 
atmospherical conditions of a particular location on Earth. And this is happening you know, at every time. So as time goes by, the atmospheric conditions at that location on Earth are changing. Um, so that's the, that's the state space, the, condition, the collection of all the possible conditions, atmospheric conditions at that location on Earth. And then phi is the map that is telling you how a current atmospheric condition is gonna evolve into a future one. Um, a number that one can compute um, from, let's say, a current atmospheric condition is the temperature, right? So that is a, a simple and useful observation function. And we're also going to use the following uh, sort of shorthand, sort of saying that sort of xi, the ith state, is essentially going to be the uh, sort of i, there's going to be i iterations of the dynamics phi given an initial point x0. Okay, so this is the sort of, these are dynamical systems. Um, th this is how dynamical systems look like, at least discrete time dynamical systems. Um, so how do, wh what does this have to do with time series data? So imagine that you have a dynamical system. So again, this is uh, what, you, what, what you get when you, get, when you, when you have a, a space of states, M, and you have a function phi that tells you how to go from one state to the next. We also have, alpha, which is this observation function. And we're also gonna fix an initial, an initial state. In addition to this data, we're also going to have a sort of set temporal resolution, right? So this may be seconds or milliseconds. So um, using our notation from before, right? So we can create a time series, we can create a, a time series by saying that a time ti the value of the time series is going to be sort of i iterations of the dynamics starting at x0, and then the observation function applied to that new state, right? So we can plot that. In, in the x-axis, we're gonna have the time, the ti's, and in the y-axis, we're gonna have the values of the observation function on the points I'm producing. So this is how we go from a dynamical system to a time series. And I find it useful to, to, to really think of time series data, right? So the things that we look at as the result of applying an observation function alpha to some underlying dynamics that perhaps one doesn't have access to. So there is this beautiful and classical theorem from dynamical systems, which is Stockens and Benning theorem. And it says the following. So assume that your state space M is a smooth Riemannian manifold of dimension M. Uh, so if these words do not mean anything to you, uh, just imagine that M is a very nice space, like the sphere or the torus or the Klein model, right? So a very nice space. Then it is a generic property of the dynamics of the evolution, right, the phi, and of the observation function alpha, that the following function uh, that sends x to this vector. And let's uh, break this up a little bit. So what is the vector doing? So it's saying, take my point x. So this is gonna be a state in, in, in my state space m. So the first thing that I'm gonna do is I'm going to apply the observation function alpha to x, right? So this gives me a real number. The other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take my state x and I'm going to evolve it using the dynamics phi one time. And then I apply the observation function that gives me another real number. Then I'm going to apply the dynamics two times to x. And then I'm going to apply the observation function that gives me another real number. And I do that all the way up to taking the state x, evolving it two m times, and then applying the observation function alpha. So this gives, me a, this gives me a way of turning, uh, of, of, of creating a function from the state space into Euclidean space. And the fact that this is an embedding means that the image of this map provides a copy of M. And by a copy, I really mean something that, that for sort of topological purposes looks exactly the same like M. So in particular, if X is, is sort of moving around a cycle because we're looking at a periodic process, 
right? Then this embedding looks also as a cycle. And the thing to notice is that this type of map, which is called a delay embedding or a delay map, um, looks exactly like our sliding window maps, right? So if we think of these as sort of the, the pieces of a time series, right? Then this looks exactly like the sliding window um, that we defined before. So this is exactly why sort of taking sliding windows of time series sort of uh, at least from the dynamical systems literature uh, is sort of justified in that it reconstructs the underlying state spaces uh, from which these time series were obtained. Um, and then one can, of course, compute persistent homology and persistence diagrams as a way to um, quantify the shape of the reconstructed uh, state spaces. Um, so there is uh, a paper from a couple of years ago, Sliding Window Persistence in Persistence and Application of Topological Methods to Signal Analysis, where the sort of mathematics of this construction from time series to persistence diagrams is analyzed in detail. So they provide several, so several theorems are provided. In particular, um, sort of some, some, some ideas on how to choose the parameters involved in this construction, right? So for example, to construct the, the, the sliding window uh, point cloud, one has to choose uh, a dimension D for the embedding and has to choose a delay parameter tau. So it turns out that those parameters can be uh, chosen from the time series. Another question that we have wrestled with in the course is, how do you choose the field of coefficients when you are doing a computation in persistent homology? Um, or does it matter? Uh, we've seen examples where it does matter, right? So for example, the Klein bottle or the projective plane. We've seen that different choices of coefficients result in different persistence diagrams. Um, so here for, for analysis of time series data, um, a natural question could be, you know, does the field of coefficients matter? So let's see an example. So let's say that you take these two functions, G1 and G2. Um, so it's a combination of two uh, cosine signals, one with uh, a double frequency, and the only difference between G1 and G2 is that I've swapped the amplitudes of the corresponding cosines. Um, so let's see what happens when one computes the one-dimensional persistence of the sliding window point clouds for each one of these functions with coefficients in Zima 2 and Zima 3 as the fields. So, so here's, the, here's the answer. So um, for the function that has the first um, sort of that th 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 the first coefficient is smaller than the second one, we see that if you choose coefficients in Zima 2 or coefficients in Zima 3, you get different answers, right? So um, here, this, this dot that is in here that has very large persistence, um, in here, you don't have a, 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 a class that has as high persistence as, as in here, right? So if we're using maximum persistence as our measure of periodicity, then we'll, one would say that coefficients, at least for this time series, that coefficients in Zima 3 is better than coefficients in Zima 2. And then for the other time series, we see that there is just no difference between the persistence diagrams. Um, so here is the, 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 the sort of the recap. Um, the field of coefficients matter, uh, and one needs recipes to, to find them. Um, so here, here are the recipes. So to summarize, um, we start with a time series and we provide this construction of sliding window point clouds. And the idea is that if there is recurrence in the time series, then that is reflected in circularity of the sliding window point cloud. And then that the shape of the point cloud can then be um, sort of measured using persistence diagrams. Um, with some theory, one can um, sort of get some guidelines on how to choose the parameters involved. Um, with also some theory, one can find that the right choice of coefficients or, or, or a, an appropriate choice of coefficients is to take uh, coefficients in a, in, a, in a field, in a prime field, uh, where the prime is bigger than the dimension of the sliding window embedding. Um, we've also seen that uh, the method that comes out of this, the swipers, uh, tends to be shape agnostic, meaning that um, sort of regardless of the shape of the, of the time series, 
Uh, it tends to be, it tends to give sort of high periodicity scores to just things that are periodic, regardless of how uh, sort of complicated they are. Um, and that is also resistant to dampening effects. Um, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to go through sort of several applications of this idea of the sliding windows and persistence. I've already shown you one to the uh, sort of discovery of periodic genes from biological systems. Um, the, next, the next application I want to go over is to uh, classification of actions from motion capture data, okay? So this is another example of, of time series data and then ideas from topology, in particular sliding windows and persistence uh, for a problem, problem in machine learning. Um, so what is, the, what is the problem that the authors uh, describe in this paper? So imagine that you have motion capture sensors. So these are the sort of white dots that we see here, 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 and other parts of the body. So those sensors are capturing the movements of the regions where they are attached. So the computer gets these sort of uh, stick figure representation of the, uh, of the body on which the sensors are attached. And then for each sensor, three time series are produced. Um, sort of the, how the X, how, how movement occurs in the X coordinate, the Y coordinate and the Z coordinate in space. Now, for each one of these time series, one can compute its uh, sliding window point cloud uh, perhaps with some subsampling to make the computation of persistence uh, more, more sort of faster. And then one can compute the persistence diagram of the uh, corresponding uh, point cloud. And then one can try to use the persistence diagrams to distinguish different types of movements. Uh, so here's a, a representation uh, where um, here's a person walking, and here are sort of the two sensors that are used. So uh, walking, there is a sensor on the wrist, a sensor on the leg, uh, and these are the corresponding sliding window point clouds for each one of those sensors. Um, and here are the persistence diagrams uh, corresponding to each one of these point clouds. And, and see how the point clouds change across different actions like waving, bicycling, and golfing, um, and, and how the uh, persistence diagrams also change uh, accordingly. So using the persistence diagrams, uh, the authors show that one can uh, obtain a very high classification accuracy. So 100% for bicycling, 98% um, for golfing, 99% for walking, 99% for waving, 100% for sitting. Um, and all of this is just using the persistence diagrams uh, from the sliding window point clouds. Another area in which um, sliding window persistence has been employed is to problems in manufacturing and engineering. So in particular to the classification of chatter in turning uh, using machine learning and, and, and ideas from topological data analysis. So what is the problem? Um, in manufacturing, when you want to produce um, a, a product that is essentially a solid piece of metal, um, one way to, to, to construct it is by uh, using cutting pieces. So the idea is that you have a rotating piece of metal against another cutting piece is, is coming into. So and as the cutting piece comes into the rotating piece of metal, then you know, metal is shaved off, and then that's how you build, that's how you deconstruct these, these solid uh, sort of objects. Um, chatter is the result of <clears throat> having the cutting piece um, perform sort of unwanted undulations, right? So if the, if, the, if the piece starts to move, then what it'll do is that it'll start to chip away at the sort of at the metal, and then that is an unwanted um, undulation. So uh, what is shown in this paper is that one can take the time series of undulations of the, of the cutting piece and use it to uh, detect chatter, which is, so again, these, uh, these chatter is these unwanted undulations of the metal piece that are gonna damage the, the, the material and the me or the metal, the metal piece that is being um, uh, manufactured. Uh, so here we have sort of this diagram where one of the regions is chatter. I believe the, the lower region corresponds to um, sort of 
a, a, a sort of combination of parameters that make the, the, the system going to chatter. So the lower piece is sort of, again, the system going into chatter. The upper piece is, again, the combination of parameters that make the system stable, so meaning no, no, no chatter. Um, it, I mean, it can be one or, one or the other, uh, but sort of one region is chatter, the other region is not chatter. The, the crosses indicate the success of using sliding windows and persistence to classify the time series as chatter or not chatter. And what we see is that we get sort of success in most areas, except for the boundary between the two conditions, which is sort of a reasonable um, classifier to have. <clears throat> so besides applications to um, biological questions like periodicity in, in, in gene expression data, or to classification of motion capture uh, to, to classification of activities for motion capture data, and then detection of chatter in mechanical systems, there's also applications to, to the medical field. So uh, in this sort of 2014 paper, um, it was shown how persistent homology of the lay embeddings, in other words, of sliding window point clouds can be applied to the problem of wheeze detection. Um, so what is a wheeze? So, so we, uh, uh, or a wheezing, is an abnormal whistling sound that is produced by, while breathing. Um, and this abnormal breathing sound is often associated with uh, conditions such, such as obstructive airway, uh, obstructed airways and lung diseases like asthma. Um, so the idea is to be able to detect uh, sort of the presence of wheezing automatically from sound recordings of someone breathing. Um, so here's what the uh, authors show. Um, it is shown that um, if you take sliding window uh, point clouds and then use their persistence, uh, one can distinguish between um, with signals, sort of sound signals without whiz, without whizzing. So this would be the black uh, signal here on the left uh, from signals with uh, whizzing, which is the black signal here on the right. And what they show is that using sliding windows and persistence, uh, they are able to achieve up to 98% accuracy in classifying these two types of signals. Uh, and then compared to 86% you know, or 95% from previous uh, studies. Well, we've seen thus far uh, several problems uh, or in several applications um, where recurrence is uh, key or, or is sort of important and, and one can use the sliding windows and persistence to quantify it. Um, so besides periodicity, there's another type of recurrent behavior that is important in, in applications. And this uh, behavior is called quasi-periodicity. Uh, let me explain what it is. So here are two time series. Um, one is cosine of t plus cosine of 3t. Uh, so this time, this time series is, of course, periodic. Um, in particular, is, this, is the superposition of two time series, right, whose frequencies um, are related via rational numbers. I'll say more about that in a minute. Um, here's another time series. This time is cosine of t plus cosine of pi t. Um, this is another time series which is recurrent, but it is not periodic, meaning this time series never repeats perfectly. The reason is that the frequencies that I have here are not related via rational numbers. What does that mean? If you take the quotient of the two frequencies that I have here, so one and three, you get a rational number. If you take the quotient of the frequency you have here and the frequency you have here, then you have an irrational number. So when you get sort of frequencies related via rational numbers, we're going to call them commensurate. And when you have frequencies that are related via irrational numbers, they're called non-commensurate. Quasi-periodicity is what happens when you have sort of non-commensurate frequencies that are super, superimposed. So these are two periodic processes, cosine of t and cosine of pi t. Each one of these is periodic in its own right. But when you super, superimpose them, um, then you get something that is not periodic, but rather quasi-periodic in that their frequencies are related via irrational numbers. Uh, moreover, if you compute the sliding window 
a point cloud of a periodic function, as we've seen before, you should expect to get uh, something that looks like a circle, right? Because again, uh, the sliding window of something repetitive will tend to be a cycle. But when you compute the sliding window point cloud of something quasi-periodic, it turns out to be a torus, a high dimensional torus. So these right away gives us a potential method to distinguish between sort of periodic processes and quasi-periodic processes. In particular, if the sliding window point cloud looks like a torus. And now this is something that we can quantify using ideas from topological data analysis, in particular persistent homology. So if you compute the persistence diagram in dimension one, let's say, for each one of these signals, then you get the following answers. The one at the top uh, will give you just one dot with high persistence in dimension one, right? Because this is a cycle. Um, and then the, the toroidal sliding window point cloud will give you two generators here. Uh, so right away, the persistence diagram is telling you that these two time series uh, are very different. One comes from a periodic sort of type of dynamics, and the other comes from a quasi-periodic type of dynamics. Uh, but why is this important? So it turns out that um, quasi-periodic dynamics, and this was observed uh, several years ago, um, that in rotating, at least in rotating fluids and, and, and sort of the onset of turbulence, um, it has been observed that quasi-periodicity is actually, uh, it actually appears as the transition from periodic to chaotic uh, dynamics, right? So this is a, an important state to be able to identify. Um, so if you're asking, you know, why is the sliding window uh, point cloud of a quasi-periodic signal expected to be a torus and of what dimension, then I would direct you to this paper, Persistent Homology of Toroidal Sliding Window Embedding. So, so there are sort of the mathematics of, of these types of constructions are uh, developed in, in, in sort of in, in detail. But uh, here's a sort of an application to music that, 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 that sort of gives you an example where quasi-periodic signals also appear. So in music, uh, there is um, something called the tritone. So the tritone happens for uh, particular uh, sort of pairs of notes that uh, differ by a particular interval, uh, the devil's interval. Uh, so the tritone is used, you know, a lot in, in heavy music, heavy rock, uh, metal. Um, and then we did this um, experiment with one of our undergrads. So Adam Houston uh, recorded himself uh, playing the horn. Um, and in particular, he played this tritone, this superposition of these two tones uh, in, in, in a particular interval. Uh, so the sound is, uh, is sort of recorded and it provides this time series. And here uh, we have the sliding window point cloud. Um, from here, we compute persistent homology in dimension one, and we see that we have these sort of two very persistent classes. So in particular, this really is sort of sampling a torus uh, and not sort of a fat circle. Um, so again, we're seeing how the tritone um, or the devil's interval, uh, which is sort of this, which has this sort of this ominous sound results in this sort of toroidal sliding window point cloud so then can be detected using uh, persistent homology. Um, thus far, we've talked about quantifi quantifying recurrence, you know, periodicity and quasi-periodicity in numerical time series data, in particular in one dimensional time series data. It turns out that similar ideas can be used to quantify recurrence in, in video data. So, so what is the idea? The idea is that a video is a time series of images. So in particular, one can do the same thing. One can do a sliding window, but now instead of a window of points one ha or, or a, one, a window of real values, now we have a window of images. Um, so using these ideas of a sliding window as point clouds, um, we, can, we can study recurrence in, in video data. So in particular, here is a visualization of the sliding window point cloud for uh, this video here of the clock, uh, which is again a time series, and of course it's periodic. Um, here's another time series, 
so it's a superposition of two oscillators, one on the left, one on the right. Um, <clears throat> if you compute its um, sliding window point cloud, which is here in the lower left, um, and you look at the persistence homology, in particular in dimension one, you will see that the dynamics are in fact uh, quasi-periodic, meaning that um, the two oscillators are moving at incommensurate frequencies. And we can detect that using the, the persistence diagram. So here are some experiments with, with real data. So we went online and um, sort of uh, collected uh, several videos of different actions, um, some more recurrent than others. Um, so we took all these videos of, of recurrent motion and maybe not so recurrent motion, and we set up an experiment using Amazon's Mechanical Turk. So we took uh, many pairs of videos and we asked human um, observers to complete the following question. Uh, they say that there are uh, five second videos, two five second videos, um, and they would like, and, and they should indicate which one is the most repetitive. Um, using that data uh, and state-of-the-art methods for uh, recurrence detection, we're able to find that um, sliding windows on videos uh, is the most aligned with what humans consider to be uh, periodic or recurrent. Um, so again, this is uh, comparing Kendall style, which is a, a ranking, uh, a measure of similarity between rankings. Um, we can see that sliding windows and humans are the most aligned. So we applied these ideas to uh, videos from um, vocal folds to um, distinguish different speech conditions at the sort of uh, physiological and, and, and sort of bio sort of mechanical level. Um, so here's a video, a normal video of vocal folds, uh, opening and closing as the person says, um, ah, it's a sustained vowel. Um, and here is the sliding window point cloud of, of, of the of corresponding to the video. And here's the persistence diagram <clears throat> for dimension one in red, and then for dimension two in green. So we can see that persistence says that videos that are sort of normal conditions uh, sort of exhibit this sort of very circular and periodic uh, structure. Now, here's, a, here's an example of, a, of an abnormal video. This is clinical asymmetry. If you compute the uh, sliding window point cloud, you get something that looks now sort of a little bit more toroidal. And when you sort of look at the persistence diagram, you see that it's clearly a clear separation between um, sort of two uh, one-dimensional classes and one two-dimensional class. So this is a torus, right? So this is a quasi-periodic signal. And what is happening is that the two vocal folds are vibrating at non-commensurate frequencies. So we took a sort of sample of several videos um, and uh, attempted to use uh, persistent scores, you know, using sliding windows uh, to try to identify uh, sort of different regimes of uh, activity. And what we found is that uh, sort of normal uh, videos like Herb's periodic or normal periodic have the highest periodicity ranking. And then things that are sort of biphonation or asymmetry uh, receive the highest quasi-periodicity rankings. Um, so many of these ideas are still part of what we call topological time series analysis. And if you're curious, uh, I invite you to check out this article where uh, other ideas are also described, and in particular, the mathematics that are observed here. Um, so in summary, um, today we have presented ideas at the intersection of uh, time series analysis and topological data analysis. We saw how uh, sliding window point clouds or time delay embeddings can be used to turn time series into um, point clouds, and then how one can measure uh, the point clouds or the shape of the point clouds using persistent homology.